asking is, was it real or was it staged? Was it made up? Now, I want you to remember something. Um, these folks that do this, uh, <laughs> they, the actors and actresses are paid professional liars. Okay. They get paid to make sure that you believe what you see. Okay. It's that simple. It's that easy. Now, here's something that's really kind of cool and kind of drastic. Um, if you think about our entire entertainment industry, and I'm going to include the, the sports industry in that. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, football, soccer, baseball, you name it, pro professional wrestling, whatever it might be. <clears throat> These people, along with the actors, many, many years ago were the people who used to entertain in the king's court. You know, we can think of the athletes today as the acrobats of old. Right, we think of the actors today. Uh, you know, they were the court jesters, and, and I really like what Jimmy Buffett has to say about that. He says, "Don't forget, you know, if the king had a bad day and it was your job to make him laugh, and you didn't make him laugh, you were going to have a bad night." Right? These folks are paid to entertain us. They are paid <clears throat> to make sure that enough advertising gets sold that they can keep their job. That being said, they do things to gain publicity. And I want you to make sure that you understand that when they gain this publicity, sometimes they are fooling you. <clears throat> they get paid to fool you. The athletes get paid to play a game. The actors and actresses get paid to fool you. Now, here's something that a lot of people don't think about. <clears throat> when these professional liars and professional athletes have an opinion, that opinion is no more important than your opinion or my opinion. They're, they're not in a leadership position. They're, not, they're in a position of celebrity, yes. But their political opinion, their medical opinion, their legal advice is no more important than yours or mine. <clears throat> so when we see these things, just remember that these folks get paid to sell advertising. They get paid to make sure you believe what you see on the big screen and on your TV. So, don't believe everything you see just because you see it in real life, okay? <clears throat> now, getting back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the spies report. There's a lot that we can say about being a spy. There's a lot we don't need to say about being a spy just remember that not every spy is James Bond or Jack Bauer <clears throat> so I want to um, remind you that there's things we see and hear and think about today that may not be the way they were centuries ago and what happens is what are you shaking your head at? Every time you get to the part where you're talking <clears throat> about Will Smith, it goes back to to, to that oh, one. That's weird. It cuts out. So is so, somebody telling you they can't? Hear? I don't know. Um, I can't get it to go any further than that. Oh wow, well, it did. That's weird. Um, we got apparently having some technical difficulty for some strange reason. But we're going to keep going and see what happens when it actually publishes. So, <clears throat> as we go through this, um, I want... Where, where was that? Oh. 
what we see or what we think of today may not have been the way it really was centuries ago. Let's think about um, maybe the similarities and differences of the spies and what the difference is when the spies went into the land the first time, representing the mixed multitude, or when Abram was called out to go into the land. Because there's some similarities here, there's some differences here, and I think it's important to look at it and see what's going on. And we're going to start with Abram uh, in Genesis 11, 26 uh, through uh, chapter 12, verse 3. After Terah was 70 years old, his son Abram, Nahor and Haran were born. This is the family history of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died while his father, Terah, was still alive. This happened in Ur in Babylonia, where he was born. Abram and Nahor both married. Abram's wife was named Sar Sarai. Sarai. <clears throat> Nora's wife was named Milka. 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 She was a daughter of Haran. Haran was the father of Milka and Iska. Sarai was not able to have children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, Haran's son, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, Abram's wife. They moved out of Ur to Ur of Babylonia. They had planned to go to the land of Canaan, but when they reached the city of Haran, they settled there. Terah lived to be 205 years old. He died in Haran. Then the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your relatives, and your father's family. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I will place a curse on those who harm you. And all the people of earth will be blessed through you. Okay. <clears throat> now, that doesn't sound like a lot to take in, but you've got to know and realize everything that's going on there. Okay? Here's the cool part. They had planned to go all the way to Canaan, the land that would become Israel, but they stopped and settled in Haran. So Abram was already well on his way to Canaan when his father chose to stop and settle. And what I want to emphasize Abram was already headed for the place that would, you know, later he would be led to, but he was interrupted. Now, there's a lot of traditions that surround Terah, or Terah, as depending on your pronunciation, uh, and including, now, now get this, here is a legend that I don't know if we can believe or not. It's a legend. Um, some claim that Tara was a leader of the soldiers under Nimrod. Okay? And, until Abram was born, that is. Because when Abram was born, there was a sign in the sky. Some say it was stars that uh, seemed to... Um, uh, what's a good word I can use here? Uh, envelop other stars, all right, the day he was born. And what that meant to those people at the time was, you know, somebody was just born who will conquer the world. And Nimrod, being Nimrod, you know, the, the most evil person ever to walk on earth, you know, I should say most evil human to ever walk on earth, he didn't like that. And he ordered Abram to be killed. And they the they reasoned then that Terah left Babylon to save Abram. And, and he set out for Canaan. 
He just didn't get there. Of course, you know, there's also a legend that Terah, Abram's father, was an idol maker. But all the Bible has to say is that he worshipped other gods. We get that from Joshua 24, 2, where it says, uh, Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says long ago, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and worshipped other gods. There's nothing in the Bible that says he made idols. Uh, that actually comes from one of the extra biblical writings and some of the uh, Mishnah writings as well. Now, eventually, Abram would be called to finish his journey. He would be, you know, let's go to Canaan, Abram. Uh, he would cross the river to become Ivrit, the first Hebrew, not the first Jew. Okay? Jewish family didn't come until later. Okay, there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of the sons' name was Judah. That's where we get Jewish from. I don't have to explain that to our Jewish listeners, but I do have to explain that to some of our Christian listeners. Because, you know, they, you know Hebrew and Jewish are not synonymous, although a Jewish person can be Hebrew, but if you're from a different family, like Benjamin or one of the others, then you're not necessarily Jewish, unless you're talking about the religion. It's two different things. Done with that rabbit trail. <clears throat> um, Abram was called out and to go to a place that he would be shown so that he could build a nation. He was going to, um, you, know, you know, even though Sarai at the time was barren, they didn't have any children, Abram had enough faith. He had heard the stories. Remember, Shem, the son of Noah, died after Abram died. They, they, they probably knew each other. Shem had probably, and I'm speculating it, but he had probably told him all of the things that he had seen Abram listened and he said, you know, if, if the creator God can do these things, why is everybody listening to these other gods? I'm going to listen to the one that I know made the world. Now, <clears throat> along the journey, along Abram's journey, you, he, there's a lot of things that happened. And some people actually attribute Abram's military prowess uh, to come from his father because, you know, of the tradition that he was in the, the, you know, he was a leader of an army under Nimrod. So it's, you know, that's speculative, but it's, it's possible. It fits the narrative, kind of. But here's something else. We know Abram was fairly wealthy even before he left. It said in verse or it says in verse four, just after Meyer stopped reading, um, that the, they began the journey with their servants. So where did that wealth come from if if it hadn't been really for Terra? All that being said, we're going to fast forward. Okay? We're going to fast forward and look at the mixed multitude in the wilderness as they prepare to go into the land. Uh, we're going to start in Numbers 13, 1 through 20, but I'm going to be nice. Okay, I'm not going to include it all because there's a lot of names in there that I know you would struggle with. So <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to skip some of that. The Lord said to Moses, send men to explore the land of Canaan. I will give that land to the Israelites, later one leader from each tribe. So Moses obeyed the Lord's command. He sent the Israelite leaders out from the desert of Paran. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, son of Yipuha, 
These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hosea, son of Nun, the name, the new name Joshua. Moses sent them to explore Canaan. He said, go through southern Canaan and then into the mountains. See what the land looks like. Are the people who live there strong or weak? Are there a few or many? What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What about the towns they live in? Do they have walls? Are they, op are they open like camps? What about the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees there? Try to bring back some of the fruit from the land. It is the season for the first grapes. So, did you, did anybody realize that Joshua's name was not actually Joshua? When his parents named him, it was Hosea. Now, Moses, it says, renamed him Joshua. But I wish y'all were able to look at the Hebrew because there's only one Hebrew letter difference between the names Hosea and Yehoshua. Ooh, isn't that amazing? One letter. Now, I could be um, a little um, sarcastic here. Okay. We know that Moses had a speech impediment, right? A lot of people say that was cured. But could it be that he was having trouble getting the name Hosea out and went, Yehoshua? It's possible. Yeah, that is a little bad joke, okay? But it's possible that it wasn't exactly um, on purpose. It could have been, but think about this. The, the uh, difference in that one letter, Hosea means salvation. It's where we get um, part of the word Hosanna, right? But Yehoshua means that Yehovah is salvation. Think about that. That's the way the Hebrew language works. Just one letter can change all of that. A lot of people today, they like to think that being a spy is something uh, you know exciting and mysterious or super secret. You know, it's it's this this really neat job filled with all kinds of James Bond, Jack Bauer intrigue. You know, there's. There's handsome men and sexy women and all the, the adventures that go with that. But what is being a spy really? It Really, you're, you're doing nothing more than gathering information. Right? Now, I know people, <clears throat> well, I should say I used to know people, uh, who were spies during the Cold War. And I can say that now because they're deceased. They are no longer uh, classified. Now, were some of the moments that they had dangerous and exciting? Yeah, probably. <clears throat> but there were more times when uh, they have told me it was sheer boredom. You're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting you know, to, to see what's next. You, you, know, you go meet this person to pick up a package, to take it to somebody. It's, it's not always what you see on television right these people remember these people are paid to make you believe things that aren't real just saying don't don't forget that we need to remember that <clears throat> the thing about being a spy is the definition of of a spy is to seek or search out. One of the words in the Bible used or translated as spies in um, or to spy, it's actually the verb spy in 
uh, the King James, it, it actually means to go walk around or go walk about. So keep that in mind. As they were going out, gathering information, as they were walking through the land, we're going to look at Numbers 13, 21 through 27. That's where we're looking at now. <clears throat> so they went up and explored the land. They went from the desert of Zin all the way to Rehob. Reho by Lebo Hamath. Thank you. Guess there's a town not far from where we are right now named kind of after this place. Guess what the name of that town is? Yeah, that's where we go. Rehoboth with from. Rehoboth. <laughs> they went through the southern area of Hebron. That is where... Ahiman? Uh, Shishaya? Talmaya? Lived. They were the descendants of Anak. The city of Hebron had been built seven years before Zon in mm -hmm. Egypt. In the valley of Eshkol, Eshkol, they cut off all the branches of a grapevine. It had one bunch of grapes on it. They carried that branch on a pole between the two of them. They also got some pomegranates and figs. They call that place the Valley of Eskol. That is because the Israelites cut off the branch of grapes there. After 40 days of exploring the land, the men returned to the camp. They came back to Moses and Aaron and all the Israelites at Kadesh. This was the desert of Paran. The men reported to them and showed everybody the fruit of the land. They told Moses, We went to the land where you sent us. It is a land where much food grows. Here is some of its fruit. Think about that for a second. Have you ever seen a bunch of grapes so big that it takes two people to carry it? <clears throat> that's, that's a big bunch of grapes, right? You know, we see these little grapevines. If you ever visit a vineyard, we see these little grapevines growing and they got... You know how they do the show thing out there with all the grapes? Well, here, these things were huge. They brought back examples of the fruit of the land. You know, they were, they were almost excited about how much was there. They had spent 40 days gathering information. And they came back, and the first thing they said was, Look at all the good stuff we've got. They gave the good news first. So now Meyer's going to continue where things kind of take a downward turn. But the people who live there are strong. Their cities are walled and large. We even saw some Anakites there. The Am 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 Amalekites live in the southern area. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the mountains. The Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan River. Then Caleb told the people near Moses to be quiet. Caleb said, We should go up and take the land for ourselves. We can do it. But the men who had gone with him said, We can't attack those, these, those people. They are stronger than we are. And those men gave the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said the land would eat us up. All the people we saw are great measure. We saw the Nephilim people there. The Anakites come from the Nephilim people. We felt like grasshoppers and they look like grasshop we look like grasshoppers to them. But remember that wasn't all of them. They observed the people who lived there were of great measure. Now, sometimes we, we think that they were giants. Um, I'm not ready to make that leap. Um, remember that Nephilim were not necessarily extremely large people. It says they were men of renown. They were well-known. They were celebrities. Could have been the football players of the day, right? Think about that. 
the tradition that they is that they were giants, but the problem is there's no mention of that in any of the th- writings about Abram when he was in the land, just a couple of hundred years prior to that, right? Abram went through the whole land. There's no mention of those folks there at that time. Now, they could have moved in, maybe. We don't know for sure. What we do know is that 10 out of the 12 who went into the land looked around. You know, they brought out this great big bunch of grapes. They brought out the pomegranates. They brought out the figs. They told everybody how great the food was. And then they said, but there's people there that we can't defeat. There's things there we're scared of. There's things there that, oh, it's just, it's terrible. Caleb was the only one who spoke out at that point. And said, it doesn't matter who's there. It doesn't matter who's there. We can do this. Later, the people would try to override Moses and Caleb. Or, I'm sorry, would try to override Moses. Caleb, <clears throat> man, Caleb and Joshua would speak and say, <coughs> excuse me, you know, Caleb and, I'm having a hard time talking tonight for some reason. Caleb and Joshua were going to speak out and say, look, if the Creator's pleased with us, he's going to make sure to give us the land where much food grows, the land that flows with milk and honey. The difference between Abram and the mixed multitude, Abram was obedient. The mixed multitude were too afraid to be obedient. They allowed their fear of the unknown to interfere with their faith. They allowed their fear of the unknown to interfere with their promise to the Creator. Remember back in Exodus 19, just a, well, a few weeks before this, really? Well, I shouldn't say it that way. It was some time before this, but just not very long at this point. Yeah, we'll do whatever you want. Of course. We'll, be, we'll listen to your voice and we'll obey. Until something scares us. They were supposed to be, you know, a a people, a nation of priests, representatives of the Creator. But now he understood that these people needed to learn how to be more afraid of him than anybody else. Abraham learned. Abraham understood. Abraham got it. Abraham went where he was was directed to go. He did everything that he needed to do. His faith was displayed through his obedience. But the mixed multitude, the spies, talked to everybody, oh, we can't do it because we're scared. We don't know what might happen. We don't have enough faith to go there because you know, what if this God who brought us out of Egypt all of a sudden now just decides, well, I'm done with you people, I'm bored. So, Moses intervenes. Numbers 14, 17 through 25. So show your strength now, my Lord. Do what you said. You said the Lord doesn't become angry quickly. The Lord has great love. The Lord forgives sin and law-breaking. He has great mercy, but the Lord does not forget to punish guilty people. When parents sin, he will also punish their children. He will punish their their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren. Show your great love. Forgive these people's sin. Forgive them as you have from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord answered, I have forgiven them as you've asked, but as surely as I live, I make this promise. 
As surely as my glory fills the whole earth, I make this promise. All men saw my glory. All these men saw my glory. They saw the miracles I did in Egypt and in the desert, but they disobeyed me and tested me ten times. So not one will see the land I promised to their ancestors. No one who angered me will see that land. But my servant Caleb has a different spirit. He follows me completely, so I will bring him into the land he has already seen, and his children will own that land. The Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys. So leave tomorrow and go back. Follow the desert road towards the Gulf of Aqaba. Aqaba. Wow. Think about that. You know, Moses intervenes. He says, wait, you know, don't you think, you know, you know, you're slow to anger, you're this, you're that, but, you know, I know you're going to punish. Oh, yeah, I'm going to punish. And look at how he says this. As I live. Is there any oath greater than when the Creator, who is eternal, never ending, no beginning, no ending, says, as I live? Everybody saw what I did. But none of these people are going to get a reward for it. They're more afraid of other people than they are of me. You know, we have that problem today, too. How many people, and, and I would imagine anybody who hears me right now, can think of a lot of people, both uh, that they know from maybe the news or from politics or from whatever, or in their own personal lives, how many people do you know who are not afraid of an angry creator? Think about that. They live their lives instead of fearing the one who made them. They fear all the things he made. They're, they, they're more afraid of you know, what the world thinks than what the Almighty thinks. Not a good way to be. The instructions that he gives to Moses, turn around, go back. With that, with that instruction, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness begins. All because the people were more afraid of the created than they were the creator. You know, they watched. They had watched the Almighty drown the entire Egyptian army, left Egypt in disarray for years. But they were still more afraid of the created than the creator, all because ten people said, we shouldn't do it. We're too afraid. It's amazing, isn't it? They allowed fear to rule their faith. When we were preparing to go on our trip, um, we visited with some friends and they, they basically prayed over us and prayed with us. And they used spying out the land as an example. Because we were, you know, as many of you regular listeners know, we were uh, going to see if where we thought we were being told to go was actually where we're being told to go, right? And the whole time I was down there, I had this weird thought in the back of my mind because... You know, I, I had said before, 
Um, I wasn't going to compare this move to Abraham leaving the land of his father, even though it's kind of exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, we're living in the house I grew up in on the farm that I grew up on and it's being sold. So we're going to need to find another place. And, you know, the only thing I was fairly sure of was it wasn't going to be right here. Um, it, it was just kind of a, a weird thing because, you know, Abram left the land that his father, where his father settled. Now, when we were on our trip, we took note of the people, you know, and, and I'm going to say that where we were, the people down there were kind to a fault almost inviting, um, very, very, uh, courteous, you know, I didn't, we were down there for, uh, a long time and I didn't really see or really hear that much of any negative input, right? Um, it, it was kind of pleasant. <laughs> in a weird sort of way. And, and it's not like we were there to be on vacation either. You know, we we were there to see, you know, look at the people, talk to the people. Um, you know, we would sit. Now, I'm going to have to say this too, because we ate some pretty good food while we were there. Huh. <laughs> we did. So, you know, and while we were there, you know, we would... You know, it's hard not to sit in a restaurant full of people and not hear the conversation, some of the conversations around you. But, the, you know, those folks were, were happy where they were. They were pleased with, with the life they were living. They were content. You could almost say it was eerily joyful. Not at all like some of the conversations we hear uh, where we are now. Because a lot of those conversations, people are irritable. It's almost sad. We, you know, we looked at the land, and it was pretty. Um, you know, um, more on that in a little bit. <clears throat> we looked at the weather. You know, how much inclement weather they ex they typically expect. We looked at the cost of living. You know, we we walked through the local grocery store. Um, we walked through some of the, the shops there in town. And it was not as expensive as it is where we currently are. So the report from us, our spy report, I guess, is that we think we have probably found the area, and we're fairly certain that's where the creator is pointing to. Now we're just waiting for him to show us the exact house that he has built for us. Um, and I can say this, and I've said this to, to people, and I may have said it on the podcast or two. Uh, waiting is the hardest thing to do. You know, waiting on the Almighty's timing is one of the most frustrating things to do. Because he will absolutely force you to be patient not ready yet you know he will he will do things i need you to go here do this all right come back i need you to go here do this all right come back i need you to go do you know and i don't want to make it sound like you know we're, we're chess pieces on a board that's not at all what i'm saying each one of these things is a lesson each one of these things is preparing the right time to move in his will not mine <laughs> now a lot of times I, I we talk to people and they're like well maybe we should go here maybe we should go there and they're talking about themselves but it's amazing you know we spied out the land We've, we've seen what's there. We're ready and willing to go. But I want to say this to the folks who are listening and maybe thinking, 
well, am I supposed to be where I am? You know, don't think just because we get we have to, to move that you have to. Now, if you're being uh, directed to make a drastic change, you know, you, you need to discern that. But think about this. Maybe all you're being asked to do is say something to a friend or to a neighbor. You may not be uh, being asked to say anything you think is drastically important. It might be something very simple. Maybe you're being asked to say something to somebody that you're standing next to that you haven't even met. Maybe in line at a, at a grocery store. Maybe in line at another market. Maybe, you know, on the street. Maybe you've been given a word for somebody who's going through something tough. You might not even know what it is. You might not even realize what you're doing. <clears throat> Maybe you're given a word or a phrase or something to say to somebody who needs to hear it. You know, there's a biblical definition for that. If you are... If you are given something to say to someone else, you're delivering a message, right? If you've been given a message to deliver, and listen carefully, because this is a biblical definition of what I'm going to say. If you've been given a message to deliver to someone else, that's the biblical definition of an angel. Because an, an angel is a job description. It means messenger. You might not be asked to move. But if you are so willing to represent your creator, he, he may begin something small, something easy, something simple. Give a kind word to this person. Ask that person if they're okay today. Maybe it's just... Something as as nonchalant, I guess, is a good way to say it, as, are you all right? Everything okay? If you... <laughs> if you have been asked to do that, if, if you are asked to be an angel to somebody that needs one, you may be the angel that the parent has prayed for to speak to a child or a grandchild. Maybe an adult child or grandchild. Because they might need to hear something you have to say. It depends on what you are being led to say. Right? You may be the angel that gives a spy the information that they need to take back and report what they've found. That's how important you may be when you choose to serve your Creator. <clears throat> Whatever your next job in the kingdom is, don't be afraid of the person or the people that you need to go to. You know, Jonah wasn't afraid to go to Nineveh. He just didn't like the Ninevites. Right? He was willing. He wanted you know, he wanted God to destroy Nineveh. He wanted to see the fire and the brimstone. <clears throat> but when he went and he delivered his message, that entire nation repented. Jonah's responsible for being, you know, Jonah's obedience is responsible for saving a nation. You might simply be asked to reach one person. Don't think you have to, to go on this gigantic move. <clears throat> but what you say, if you are given something to say, don't hold it back either just because you're afraid. If you're truly given something to say, speak up and say it. Whatever that might be. 
especially if it's a kind word. Now, sometimes people like me are given words of warning. And you've all heard them, right? But typically, when it's a one-on-one, -on -one, it's not as much of a warning as it is encouragement. Not everybody is called to to move away. Not we listened to a very interesting teaching from uh, Yehuda Glick, who used to be a, a member of the Israeli Parliament or Knesset, I should say. And you know his reasoning, you know about taking care of widows and orphans. And he, when he asked people, he says, oh, yeah, I, I take care. I look after the orphans. I donate to an orphanage, you know, that's like across the ocean. That's not what the Bible says. You, he, they, what the whole concept is, is you take care of the people closest to you. I use the analogy of if you have a hole in your yard and all you do is rake leaves into it, it's a dangerous trap because you know, it's kind of like throwing money at a problem. It's a dangerous trap because the problem's still there. It's just covered up. You don't have to move, you know, miles and miles away. You simply have to be willing to be obedient. You have to be willing to not be afraid of the people while you're still being obedient, fearing, and loving your Creator. Because that's how we improve the world. You want to change the world? Start by looking inside yourself. What are you afraid of? What are you more afraid of? Are you afraid of the giants? Now, Maybe your giant is only about three feet tall. Maybe your giant is a doorway. Maybe your giant is being afraid that you'll succeed. Don't be afraid to succeed. Don't be afraid to be obedient. Go do what you're being asked to do. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that today? No, thank you for joining us tonight. And we'll see you on Monday. For now. Wherever, wherever home may be later, that's a good question. <laughs> I have a good idea where it might be, but we'll see. Um, I forgot to tell everybody earlier that the chat was open. I apologize. If you want to leave us a comment on chat, that's fine. You can also do so um, on our private message thing. Oh, that reminds me. While we were away, I noticed something, and I, um, I've been kind of weaning away, more away from Facebook and using other social media like um, MeWe, and there's a very, very good one out there called the Tor Network. I, I'm going to tell the, the folks that are typically listening from Facebook or getting the notifications from Facebook, you're going to see less and less of that. Um, just because I, I can't support a company that is doing the things they're doing. It's just as that simple. You know, I, stopped going to a certain denomination church because they were giving their money to people I didn't agree with. And when Facebook does the same thing, I'm not going to support that. So I'm not, I'm not sure how much longer I'll be in their algorithm logs. So um, make sure that if you want to keep following me, check us out on either MeWe or on the Tour Network. We are there every day so if that's all we've got we will be back Monday 
Not sure what I'm ready to talk about Monday yet. I'm still kind of wound up and in search mode. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Until Monday, everyone. Many, many blessings. Thank you.